Hi, my name is Rene August and I live in a country now known as South Africa, in a land now known as Cape Town, the home of the Khoi and the Sand people. So much of my story about blind spots comes because of my culture, my country, my story of origin, the words that have been spoken to me, about me and over me, over decades. Not only mine, but words that have been spoken to my parents and my grandparents. And so these contexts have shaped and changed me and them and also affects how I read the Bible. It affects the spectacles through which I read and these spectacles shape the lens through which I see. And so I want to say thank you to those of you who know me, who have invited me to participate in this Justice Conference and given me an opportunity to share just a little bit of my own story, especially around discovering my own blind spots. I think a point of departure for me right now is to say that I have learned over the years that the language, the culture, the textures, the history, the geography, the social, religious, political, and economic location of the storytellers in the Bible largely shape the meaning in the words of the text. So the world of the text helps us understand the meaning in the text. I grew up in South Africa and as a young child, I heard this word apartheid a few times. We would go for drives as a family and my dad would say, let's go to the beach. And we'd all be excited and say, yes, let's go, let's go. And we'd drive past these beaches that were just beautiful. And I'd say, daddy, stop here, stop here, can we swim here? And he'd say, oh, there's no parking, there's no legal parking here. We can't really stop here. And then he'd keep driving until he got to a beach that wasn't so nice. And then he'd say, oh, here's a great parking spot. And he would park there and then we would go and play in the sand and swim in the sea. It was only later that I learned that those beaches were reserved for whites. And my father didn't want to tell me that I wasn't allowed to go to those beaches. And so he made up stories about parking and it's too hot here. And, oh, I, this is the wrong kind. There's too much wind and different stories he would tell us just to divert from the truth that the laws in my country said I was not allowed to swim in those beaches. When I was a grown-up, when I had the ability to understand a little more, those things changed how I felt about myself. Even though the Word of God says I'm made in the image of God, I'm beautifully and wonderfully made. What my culture and my context said to me about who I am and where I belong affected how I saw myself and so affected my ability to believe the words of God in the word of God. Have you ever wondered why we have four Gospels and not one? I mean, if it's the Gospel, then surely there's only one. But we're four. We're four versions of the same story because the gospel writers recognized that when the audience changed the way we message the same truth has to change. It has to take into account the culture, the history, 
the language, the experience of the people listening to this gospel. Remember, the gospel was written, but many people were not literate. And so they heard the gospel. They heard the gospel proclaimed. They didn't read it privately in their room while they were having a quiet time. And so as they heard it, they shared it with one another. And one might say, oh, I remember this part. Oh, and I remember this part. Try it. Get together with a group of friends and have one person read out the Gospel of Mark, the whole Gospel. And then with these friends, you retell what you heard. And you will see that different people will latch on to different parts of the Gospel. Now, what makes you latch on even to what I'm saying today happens because of our prejudice, because of our bias, and also because of our blind spots. And so what is a blind spot? Let me use my hands as an illustration. I cannot see my hands right now. Does it mean that they're not there? Oh, wait. Here they are. Can you see them? I can see them. How about now? I can still see them out of my peripheral vision. I can see one, I can see the other. How about now, can you see my hand? I can see something in the corner of my eye. And now, can you see my hands? I can't see my hands. How about now? I cannot see my hands at all. How do I know that my hands are there? If my hands stay where they are, the only way I can know that my hands are still here is if you tell me. You see, I need a different perspective so that I can find out what is in my blind spots. And it is only when I change my perspective that I'm able to see what is in my blind spot. One more thing to add to help us understand blind spots. When we read the Bible, who we read the Bible with is also a lens. It's also a perspective. It's something that helps us see. And when we only read the Bible with people who look like us, then we will only continue to see the things that people like us see. But when we change the audience, suddenly we're able to see things that have always been there and understand ideas and concepts that really changes what we understand these words to mean. Another significant shape to the lens through which we read the Bible is that of geography, where we read the Bible. Now, I read the Bible in many places, but when I'm reading the Bible on my own in my bedroom or besides the ocean, just outside my door, or I read the Bible in a noisy, busy city, or I read the Bible on a protest march, or I read the Bible in a slave lodge. What the words mean suddenly can have a little more emphasis or help me deepen my understanding of what I'm reading. And so where do you read the Bible? The world of the Bible helps us make sense of, gives meaning to the words in the Bible. And they form the shape of the spectacles through which we read the Bible. One more thing that creates the shape of the lens through which we read the Bible is who we're reading the Bible with. Another thing that I discovered creates the shape of the lens through which I read the Bible 
is where I read it. How about that story of John the Baptist while he is in prison? And reading that story when you're sitting in a prison with someone. The last thing that I want to refer to as one of the things that give shape to the lenses through which we read scripture is our picture of Jesus. You see, scripture says that Jesus is the fullest revelation of who God is. And so if we want to understand the word of God, we need to read it through the spectacles of the living word of Jesus. When we come to the word of God, we have to read it through the living word of God, Jesus, the revelation of God. Not all things that are in the Bible is Christian. Actually, there's nothing in the Bible that's Christian because the Bible is, is a Jewish tradition. Even though the disciples in the book of Acts were called Christian for the first time, it wasn't that word Christian as we understand it today. It was they were recognized as having been with Christ. You might be wondering why I, as a woman, am feeling confident to, to speak about the Bible. Well, how is it that the Bible says that women should be silent in church and I'm a priest? Am I being disobedient? <laughs> well, you see, Jesus never once told a woman to be quiet. Can I say that again, ladies? Jesus never once told a woman to be quiet. In fact, when we see women in the Bible, we see Jesus' relationship with them as being radically different to virtually every story that we see about women in the Bible. You can think about 1 Samuel 13, the rape of Tamar and how she's treated by her father and her brothers who know that she's been raped by another brother. And then you can see how Jesus responds to the Canaanite or the Syrophoenician woman Canaanite woman with a sick child screams to Jesus in the street. Unheard of. Culturally barbaric. I mean, it is just unbelievable that Jesus even stops for her. But Jesus stops. Jesus turns to her. Jesus speaks to her. Jesus sees her. And even more insane, <laughs> she wins an argument with Jesus. Do you know how many people came to argue with Jesus in the Gospels? The only person to win an argument with Jesus is a Canaanite woman. What? That blows my mind. When we think of the story of the resurrection, John tells us that it was the women who went to the tomb in the morning. They found the stone rolled away. They went to the guys. Because a woman's testimony means nothing in the world of the text. A woman could not bear witness to anything. But the women see the stone rolled away and they go call two guys, Peter John. They run, they get there. When they go inside the tomb, what do they see? An empty tomb with folded grave clothes. That's all they see. <laughs> when the woman Mary goes into the tomb, what does she see? Same tomb, two angels, two angels. And they tell her the story that Jesus is not there. He is risen. So the first person to hear post-resurrection of the resurrection of Jesus is a woman. And then she goes out into the garden. She's still confused. She's devastated, crying. And through her tears, she thinks that Jesus is a gardener. And he speaks her name, Mary. And as she embraces him, he says, go and tell your brothers that I have risen. Jesus says to a woman, go and tell. She knows. 
Her testimony is not valid. Jesus knows her testimony is not valid. If a woman goes to say Jesus is risen from the dead, that doesn't mean that Jesus is risen. No one will believe her. She needs two men to verify the testimony. But does God reveal the risen Christ and the resurrection to the two men? No. <laughs> to a woman. And then Jesus tells her, go and tell. So yes, the Bible does say women must be quiet in church. But Jesus, who is the living word, tells a woman to go and proclaim the gospel. And because of the words of Jesus to a woman, I receive that as a way of saying women be silent in church is not the only instruction that the Bible gives. It's a way of women hearing, oh, the Bible has a few more things to say about women, not only be quiet. And if you want to follow Paul that says be, women be quiet, that's up to you. I follow Jesus who tells the woman, go and tell. I was invited to a conversation with some friends. We came from different countries on the continent of Africa. And we were asked to make a list of the top 10 issues in Africa that were the most urgent. I don't remember them all, but I remember this. We made an agreement that we would meet together regularly to read the Bible through these spectacles. I invite you to think about the issues in your country. What are they? And what would happen if you read the Bible through those spectacles for three months even? I've spent the last few years reading the Bible through the lens of a question. What is the movement of power? I remember when we read the Bible through the lens of economics. I was reading the Gospels through that lens and Oh my goodness, the things I was able to see. N not because anything else changed. But my blind spots were exposed. And that's what happens when we choose a set of spectacles. When we choose a lens through which to read the Bible, we're able to see what was always there, but we never really noticed. For example... When Jesus is presented in the temple, to realize that Jesus was poor, that Mary and Joseph were poor. Luke just writes, you know, as was the custom, they came and offered two doves. It's not the custom. It's not the custom to bring two doves as an offering for your firstborn son. Not on the day of his circumcision. Oh no, we need to understand Leviticus and Deuteronomy to understand what that means. The law goes on to say, but if you have no lamb, no livestock, no corn, no barley, no oil, if you have nothing, bring two doves as an offering. So we know Mary and Joseph had nothing. When we read the, the Bible through the lens of land or place or geography, Nazareth, Jesus comes from Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Palestine, a Jewish man, born in probably the most contested land in the world. I don't know what else. To say about this journey except that it changed my life forever. And so an invitation to you. You don't know what your blind spots are because <laughs> you're blind to it. But how can, how can we discover our blind spots? Especially the blind spots that we have when it comes to reading 
the word of God. I invite you to try this. To read the Bible through the lens of this question. What is the movement of power in this story? The movement of social power between people, of economic power. What's the movement of money? The movement of spatial or geographical power, location. What is the movement of religious power? What is the movement of political power? As we read this story that we find woven from Genesis to Revelation. And, and as we look at that story, we need to spend some time learning about the world of the text so that it can help us make sense of the words and the meaning in the text. And as we do this reflection on what is the movement of power, as we ask this question in particular, I invite you to lean into the Gospels. There's some crazy stuff there. If we read the Bible through the lens of geography, you'll need a map. It's like it says Jesus was on his way from the Netherlands to France. And when he came to Egypt, he found, oh, 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 wait, 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 what do you mean? There's certain places that Jesus just constantly goes to. There's a movement in Matthew. There's a movement in Mark. There's a movement. The geographical movement of the story is part of what the story is and the meaning of the story. When it says Jesus went to Jerusalem, I don't know where your parliament is. If I say to you, I was sitting in the House of Lords or the White House in Washington, D.C. Or I was sitting around a campfire with some friends and said, or I was sitting in a refugee camp with a group of children and said, do you see how the world of the words matter to what the words would mean? I can say the same thing in each one of those places that I've named. And they will mean different things because of where those words are spoken and to whom those words are spoken. And so it is with the Bible. And so in this invitation for you to explore the geography of the Gospels, the economic realities of the Gospels. I mean, there's so many stories that come to mind, but the, the story of the Good Samaritan, I mean, the naming, there's, there's culture there, there's race involved. Jewish people and Samaritans, they just didn't get along. And so to say a good Samaritan, I don't know what the equivalent of that is in your country, but to call a Samaritan good is certainly not a way of helping people lean into the story. They'll go, oh, this is gonna be a terrible story. But Jesus says, this good Samaritan, and then Jesus says, had compassion on this man. Yes, there was the priest and the teacher of the law that walked by, but the Samaritan is named as having the characteristic of God. God of compassion, Samaritan of compassion. What? And then the economics. He takes his oil and bandages the man's wounds. Medical supplies are expensive, especially in those days. Then he picks the man up and, you know, puts him on his own donkey. In other words, he might call him an Uber on his credit card. He takes the man to an inn and he pays the innkeeper from his own pocket. And then says to the innkeeper, take care of him. 
And when I come back, if there's any more outstanding, I will pay it. Compassion. The compassion of God will cost you something as you love your neighbor. Because that's the context of the question. There's a lawyer, someone who knows the law, who asks Jesus, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus answers and then he says, yeah, correct, answered correctly. But because he was trying to catch Jesus out, it says, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And this is the context of this story of the Good Samaritan. The road is important. It doesn't just say he was walking down the road. He was walking down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, what is Jericho in the Bible? And what is Jerusalem in the Bible? And why is there a Samaritan walking down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho? And why is there a priest and a teacher? Of the, it's, these are not unusual things. The priests lived in Jericho and they served in the temple in Jerusalem. So for a Samaritan to make his way down that road is, is a very courageous man. <laughs> He's very courageous. It might be a shorter cut, but it is full of prejudice and abuse that would be hurled at him for him being a Samaritan. And yet when he walks down this road, he's the one who acts the most like God. He's the one who, like Jesus, is willing to give, to pay the price for someone else's restoration and healing. What does that mean for how we follow Jesus? You see, I've only noticed these things because I've chosen to put on the spectacles of economics and the spectacles of geography and the spectacles of religious power. And as I ask the question about that movement, suddenly these things that have always been there, but in my blind spot, these geographical details, these religious details, these political details, these racial details have always been there. But it is only as I changed my perspective that they came into clearer focus and helped me understand the world of the text, which when opened, helped me understand the meaning of the words in the text. And so, as you think about blind spots, it's a lot easier to see the blind spots of other people but this is an invitation to you to be intentional, to choose a different perspective, choose a different set of spectacles. You might be surprised at what you see. And so, In this invitation to discover our blind spots. A blind spot is not something you can see on your own. You need to be willing to put on a different set of spectacles to give you a new way of seeing and then as we try different lenses we will notice different things. And as we notice these things, please pay attention to who you are reading with and then invite others to join in the conversation so that together we might not only see one another's blind spots but have our blind spots revealed as our perspectives change. Thank you.